Hi guys, it's Reagan and welcome back to another video. Today is a video I'm so excited to be putting together because I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite topics ever, and that is fantasy books. Specifically today, I'm going to be highlighting some fantasy books that I think are criminally underrated. All of the books I'm about to talk about today are some of my all-time favorites and all of them need much more love than they're currently getting. Many of them have like under 10,000 reviews on Goodreads. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive right in. The first series I'm going to talk about is the Inheritance Trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. This trilogy, I would say, is not so unpopular, but in comparison to some of N.K. Jemisin's other work, which are rightfully beloved, I really feel like more people also need to check this trilogy out. The first book in this trilogy is called The Hundred Thousand kingdoms and it is set in a world where politically a hundred thousand kingdoms are controlled and ruled by one central very powerful government and the reason why this government is so strong is they actually enslaved the gods and they use the power of the gods to basically continue to be able to control all of these different ruling bodies and ensure that no one steps out of line. In this story one of our main characters we follow is Yena and at the beginning of book one she is summoned back to the capital of this empire by her grandfather. Her mother was was actually the heiress to this very powerful place, but fled it to basically marry for love. And since then, she was basically cut out of this family. After her mother's mysterious death, she is summoned once again, essentially in an effort to get back at his now dead daughter. He has decided to throw his granddaughter, Yena, in the middle of a political like conspiracy. Namely, he has named her as one of his heirs, not in an effort to think that she might actually take the throne, but instead kind of be in the center of a bloodbath as all the other heirs begin to fight each other for this powerful position. Yena is essentially thrown headfirst in the midst of court politics. She has to quickly make allies and also just try to understand politically and socially how this place even works. Amongst all of this, she also comes across the enslaved gods and she begins to make a deal with them in hopes of freeing them, but also securing her own future. This trilogy is truly incredible. Again, it really expands with each book. The first one is really focused on Yena, but again, Again, we have different central main characters in later stories, really growing not only the political reality of this world, but the consequences of a lot of decisions are all really played out and it's so satisfying. Obviously, this is a generally popular series, but in comparison to some of N.K. Jemisin's other work, I really feel like this needs more hype, more love, more people need to check this out. It's one of my favorite fantasy trilogies out there. It's incredible. The next book, at least last time I checked, has under 10,000 reviews on Goodreads. Please check this book out if you haven't already. It's actually a fantasy standalone, and that book is The Sword of Kaigen by M.L. Wang. The author was able to accomplish in a single book is honestly astounding. From the incredible world building and the backdrop that the author creates for this story to unfold in, the very complicated international balancing act between different empires and countries kind of caught in the crossfire. We have really thought out and well-written combat, which also centers on elemental magic, not to mention some of the best written characters and character arcs that I have ever come across in fantasy. But this is a story that's set on the Kinsongi Peninsula, which is part of the Kaganese Empire. This particular peninsula is known as the Sword of Kaigen, famous for housing the empire's most powerful warriors. Specifically, they're able to utilize sort of ice elemental magic, and they're kind of the first line of defense for any type of invasion that is threatening the Kaganese Empire. In this story, we follow two main characters. The first is 14-year-old Mamamaru, who is determined to not only learn the secrets of his family's combat, but also do well in school and make his family proud. However, at the beginning of this book, he makes a new friend who comes from outside the empire, and he begins to learn perhaps some different stories and different history that's not really told to him at school. And when he begins to have these questions, he confides in his mother, Mizaki, our other main character in this story. Who herself has a very complicated past and has since hidden away her own sword once she decided to have children. But her son's questions begin to bring a lot of things up from her past, as well as a looming invasion and threat to not only her family, but the peninsula itself. Things very quickly begin to boil over. This book is emotional. It has so 
much combat. It's also so successful between oscillating between past and present. The family relationships that are present in this and particularly the focus on motherhood is just one of my favorite aspects of the story as well. I sobbed reading this, but I also could not put it down. Just everything about it was incredible. I love this standalone so much. Everyone needs to read it. Next book I have to recommend is City of Stairs by Robert Jackson Bennett. I feel like a lot of people are familiar with this author, but more so for the Foundry Side series, which is a great fantasy series as well. Honestly, this trilogy by him for me is still my favorite. I also feel like the concept of this fantasy world was just so successfully realized. And again, this is another trilogy that kind of hyper focuses on a different main character with each book and also allows a rather significant amount of time to pass between each book, really giving space to not just the conflict, but the complicated political reality that this world exists in. This is set in a world where a once powerful land called Bulakov used to reign. They were able to maintain such great power because they had the power of the gods on their side. And they used this power not only to boost themselves up, but also subjugate many lands surrounding them and pursue their own colonial interests. However, before the start of this novel, one of the lands that they were controlling had a rebellion and they were actually able to successfully kill off the gods themselves, resulting in a significant moment called the blink. This blink is exactly as it sounds because in a blink of an eye not only did the gods disappear from this land but the ruling body most of the infrastructure that held this place together buildings streets roads inventions disappeared instantaneously as well resulting in a once very powerful land falling to chaos and destitute overnight. Now a land once controlled by this great empire actually controls Bolokov itself is very involved in preventing their re-rise to power. And they do this by basically erasing all history mention of the gods themselves. So most religion in history has been removed from this land. In this book, we follow our main character, Shara, who is a government agent, essentially a spy, tasked with traveling to one of Bolokov's major cities and basically trying to sniff out any unrest and also ensure that some rumors that have been rising about the gods coming back are untrue. And from there, we basically follow Shara as she begins to investigate and uncover some truths. But again, due to the complicated political nature of this world, World. Lots of things really unfurl from there. This book is so good. This series is incredible. It just has so many twists and turns, but just the concepts and the themes of this are just so excellent as well. And again, I love all of the characters present in this, and I really appreciate how the author shifts us from different geographical locations throughout this series as well. It's just so good and one of my all-time favorite fantasy series. The next series I have to recommend is one that I feel like I talk about a lot on my channel, but is generally very underappreciated, especially if you look at the amount of reviews it has and that is the Sendlin Ascend series by Josiah Bancroft. This is just another super unique fantasy series that honestly I have read nothing else like this in all of my fantasy reading years. From the writing style to the characters, the setting, it just felt so wholly fresh and the quartet is now finished and I really loved this series from beginning to end. I often describe Sendlin Ascends as like if the whimsy of middle grade met the darkness of adult fantasy but also had like a a beautiful writing style that you often find in like literary fiction. This series follows one of our primary main characters, Senlin. And Senlin has always dreamed of traveling to this very famous tower in this world called the Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel is comprised of thousands of different floors. It's full of thousands of different people, each floor having not only its own style, but often political system, structure, like architectural style, industry, like everything about it is wholly unique from floor to floor. Senlin has always dreamed of exploring this place and he has finally decided to check it out with his new wife and they travel there on their honeymoon together. Unfortunately though, right when they arrive, they are separated and so begins Senlin's journey as he desperately tries to locate his lost wife and you see him explore different floors of this tower, make enemies and friends along the way, and also kind of crack open a larger political conspiracy that involves the entire tower and the history of the tower itself. Fantasy point of view, this has elements of like steampunk machine based fantasy 
fantasy. And it's also just so incredibly quirky. All the different concepts from floor to floor, the different characters, just the different vibes that you come across, again, are just wholly so unique to me. I loved following the journey of Senlin. This series has so many different characters you will fall in love with. And it just really grew on itself so, so well from book to book. Again, this is truly one of my favorite fantasy series. The next book that's on my list is Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. And this is the first book to a new incredible fantasy series by this author. And if you decide to pick this book up, it's just in time before the release of book two. So it's a perfect opportunity to marathon, which we love to see. This is a very intense multi POV story where we're following what seems to be very disparate players who ultimately have their fates become very much intertwined as this countdown to this religious event begins to occur. In the holy city of Tova, the winter solstice is usually a time for celebration, but the winter solstice this year aligns with a very rare and very religiously significant event, which is the eclipse. And what is occurring in the background of the preparation for both of these two significant events is a populace that is feeling constrained not only by the weight of history, but religious expectations, and and in general is starting to feel unsatisfied with current religious leaderships. And one of the main characters we actually follow is a recently promoted religious figure who is not only fighting against internal squabbling within the tower itself, but also trying to ensure that there isn't complete upheaval amongst the populace. Outside of the city, we also follow one of our other main characters, Zayala, and she is a ship captain, a very good one at that because she can actually control the water and tides themselves. This is an ability that she has to keep secret. At the beginning of the story, she takes on some very mysterious cargo, but it promises to bring her a lot of money. She has to bring this cargo to the city of Tova before the eclipse. The cargo itself turns out to be a single man who is blind and left blindfolded on her ship. And while she is told that this cargo is harmless, she is not so sure. And of course, our third main character we follow is that very man on this ship who was ties to a very extreme religious organization in the area. Again, and this is a story that brings together all three of these characters in very unlikely of ways. They all have their own motivations and agendas, but the fate of their aspiration and their lives all occur in the shadow of this upcoming eclipse, as well as the current tensions that are existing within the land itself. This book is incredibly engaging. I love the different nuances of religion and the different factions of religion that are outlined within this story. I love that it highlights history, but also how history itself can be very limiting or restricting as people are trying to progress and change. It's so good. I thought it was a fantastic book one and I can't wait to check out the next book in the series. The next book has less than 2000 reviews on Goodreads. It is a recent release, but nonetheless, more people need to check this book out because it's so good and also such a fresh take in the fantasy space. And that is The Justice of Kings by Richard Swan. I loved this book. Not only was it an absolute page turner, but the perspective and point of view that the story is told in, I just simply was not anticipating and it was so successful. But this is set in the Empire of the Wolf and it is simmering in unrest. And one of the main characters we follow is Sir Conrad Van Vault and he is a justice. And in this land, justices are allowed to basically travel, investigate various crimes against the crown, against the populace. And they also act as like the judge and executioner depending on the situation. They also have very specific and powerful types of magic, which otherwise are not really accessible by the general populace. And at the beginning of the story, Sir Conrad Van Vault is investigating what seems to be a corruption scandal within a small town surrounding some nobles. But as he begins to dig deeper, it begins to show like larger ties to empire ending conspiracy and possible rebellion across the land at large. However, this book is not told by Sir Conrad Van Vault's point of view at all but instead his young female apprentice who is basically learning how to be a justice and it is written from her point of view but like much later in life. This particular story is one of her first like significant trials and investigations. So she is writing about this trial and investigation with the context of her later experience, if that makes sense. I think this decision on the perspective was just so successful as you not only have a narrator who's able to tell us everything with kind of an objective later in life point of view, but also has the ability to kind of poke fun at their 
earlier version of themselves, perhaps for being a little too dramatic or just not handling a situation as they would now. But you also quickly get the sense that while this investigation was important at the time, it's more of like an indicator of the much worse things that are going to come. I loved this book from the investigation. It really kept you flipping the pages. I wasn't sure who was really involved in the larger conspiracy. And it was so fun to work with our main characters to figure out what was going on. But once I finished this book, I was also left with this feeling of, I want like a million books set in this world. I wanna to continue to follow these characters as they're working to unwind whatever large conspiracy is at play. And I wanna to continue to have it told from this later in life point of view. I was gripped by this story. I loved how it was told to us. I just felt like it was so, so smart. I just feel like it's one of the best sort of detective oriented fantasy stories I have read in a while. And the very last series I'm going to chat about, I feel like shouldn't be too much of a surprise. And that is the Live Ship Trader series by Robin Hobb. Here's the deal. Robin Hobb is popular, but I feel like she should be so much more popular than she is. Like everyone should be required to read her books. But really, I just feel like she should have hundreds of thousands of reviews for this series on Goodreads and she doesn't even have 100,000 yet. Like more people need to read this, more people need to check out Robin Hobb's world because her characters are intricate. The plot payoff is significant. It is an emotional ride from beginning to end. All of her trilogies are incredible, but I'm gonna highlight the live ship trader because I want to say it's my favorite. I've Ship Trader series is actually multi POV. If you're familiar with the Farseer trilogy, you know that that series and many books after that primarily just follow one character and that's Fitz. But in this world, we have a whole cast of characters, their wants, their desires, their expectations, and it is harrowing and I love it so unbelievably much. But the context of this is that this is a story that very much centers trading. One of the primary locations we are set in is called Bingtown. And here trading and shipping is life. Families have dedicated their entire life, many generations to building out their own trade routes, their connections, all of these things. Also, there is one specific thing that comes from Bingtown that is very rare, and that is there are live ships that exist here. And you might be able to tell based on the name, but truly the ships themselves are alive. They have a personality and a consciousness. And these ships and the secret of these ships are protected dearly. I'm not kidding when I say the cast of this book is incredibly large and the agonizing character arcs that we follow will absolutely destroy you. I would say though, primarily we're following one single family from Bingtown and their their own like disparate paths they're taking from each other. Don't get me wrong, it's not just traders we follow, there's also groups of pirates that enter the picture and everything slowly becomes connected in the most agonizing of fashion. I also just have to say the different types of dynamic female perspectives you encounter in the Live Ship Trader series is amazing. Different generations of women as well and their complicated relationships with each other and society and expectations that are put upon them. This series is amazing. It will destroy you. I know I've said that multiple times, but I just don't think any other fantasy series has emotionally impacted me quite like the live ship traders, if I'm being honest, but I love this trilogy so much. It's definitely in like my top three favorite fantasy series out there. So I just implore you to perhaps check it out. And I just honestly think Robin Hobb in general is criminally underrated. Alrighty guys, those are some of my favorite underrated fantasy reads. Let me know down below some fantasy series that you think more people should check out as I would love to know. And I will see you soon with another video soon. Goodbye.